Cool. Um, yeah, so hello. Um, welcome to Ethics for Data Science. I uh, should start by giving the disclaimer that this is my first time teaching a course by Zoom, so maybe figuring some of it out um, as we go. Yeah, and I um, wanted to start by just acknowledging that this is a very kind of unusual and I think very stressful time for, for many of us, including me, um, that uh, kind of with the current situation with uh, COVID-19, um, that this is, I think, <laughs> going to be different than the, the class would have been otherwise, um, and I realized that um, you may be distracted. Um, I'm, I'm distracted in certain ways. Uh, so just to, to kind of put that out there. Um, and that I do really think your, your kind of health and safety are the, the most important things. Um, so we've got, yeah, the kind of shelter in place order this week, uh, kind of very, uh, very new uh, situation. Um, do you want to note that I currently don't have any child care, uh, so you may hear my daughter in the background. I've also had uh, less time to put into the course than I would, uh, would normally. I'm also spending more time uh, cleaning and sanitizing things. I hope, I hope you are as well. Um, I'm going to try, I think, doing questions through the, uh, the, the group chat, um, so if you do have any questions or comments. Um, that's the that's the way to go, and I will try using the breakout rooms later on in class for some for some small group discussion. Um, yeah, just if you're interested, I um, together with Jeremy Howard wrote a post about COVID nineteen, and this was a. Uh, 10 days ago, so it's already, I guess, um, outdated. Um, but uh, many people have uh, said that they found it helpful in convincing relatives who, who weren't, uh, uh, weren't taking the epidemic seriously on, on why they should. And so I'm going to start with um, some ways that uh, the coronavirus um, intersects with data ethics issues as kind of a just uh, 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 current events kind of tying into the, the issues we'll be discussing in this class. So I'll kind of go through some of these current event issues and then I will kind of back up and give you a little bit more context about the class and then get into today, today's lesson. Um, oh, I um, actually our grader is here and so I am happy for our grader to, to introduce himself. He's a, an alum from the, the MSDS program. So, Paul, do you want to say hello? Yeah, hey, hey everyone. Um, this is Paul. Um, like Rachel said, I, I, I'm an alum. I graduated in the last cohort, uh, and I hope everyone's staying safe and you know, staying home and you know, practice, you know, doing, doing all the best practices. Um, I currently work at the FDA as a data science fellow, um, so I'm doing some work with you know, imported foods and assessing risks and, and things like that. Uh, I'm really excited about, about this class and to be to helping out Rachel in the grading creating your assignments. Rachel is super good at, you know, really, really well read and in, in, in data ethics. Um, and if you haven't followed her Twitter, I mean, she, she is a really, really good resource for all this stuff. So yeah, I'm really excited to be here and uh, nice to nice to meet you guys. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, actually, I just wanted to check, is the background noise for my daughter too much for folks? This is a noise canceling headset, but I just... Okay, I see a few no's. That's reassuring. Um, let me know if the, the background noise ever gets uh, kind of distracting. Um, nobody else needs to respond now. That was helpful. Thank you. And yeah, and thanks again, Paul. I really, uh, really enjoyed having Paul in class last year, and I'm glad to have him back, uh, back as a grader. Um, so here, I wanted to talk about first uh, this idea of an infodemic. So the WHO dubbed the coronavirus an, uh, a massive infodemic on February 2nd. Um, and an infodemic is defined as an overabundance of information, some of which is accurate and some which isn't, that makes it difficult for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when they need it. Um, so we've kind of been really inundated with information, and some of it's great, some of it's not, and we're having to filter through. Um, and it's kind of unprecedented, kind of the scale, uh, the scale of this. Uh, so there have been several articles on issues of uh, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, this is uh, one I just read today on why coronavirus misinformation is out of control. Um, sharing what we've heard is how we process traumatic events, uh, but that can be harmful if we end up kind of sharing things that, that aren't true. Uh, last week, 
last week there was a list of um, coronavirus tips that went viral. Um, unfortunately, uh, many of them were false. This was, I don't know if you saw it, the, the one about like taking a sip of water every 15 minutes or uh, making sure you could hold your breath for 10 seconds. Um, these things uh, do not prevent you from getting coronavirus. They don't uh, determine that you don't have it. Yet this was very widely shared and it was, it was not actually from Stanford um, as, it, as it said. Another article, uh, people, people on Nextdoor are freaking out about coronavirus. Uh, they have been spreading falsehoods, linking the virus to homelessness, eating meat, and um, uh, using tree, tree, tea tree oil as a sanitizer, uh, which you cannot do. Do not use tea tree oil uh, as a sanitizer. Um, so this is kind of um, in the news a lot and, and impacting a lot of people. Oops. All right, and so then I um, kind of wanted to bring up, because uh, this actually made me think again about one of our readings for this week on mediating consent uh, by Renee DeResta. And so um, in the article, uh, Renee kind of goes through this history, and Renee is one of the, the foremost experts on computational propaganda. Um, and even she's looked at it from a lot of different angles. Uh, she was uh, very early on uh, kind of involved in pushing back on the anti-vaxxer movement and uh, studying the ways that anti-vaxxer propaganda spread. She also did the analysis on uh, Russian interference in the 2016 election. And she's now at the Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, but she talks about kind of um, historically there was a, a kind of a long stretch of time where, you know, in the U.S. there were just three major U.S. Uh, news networks, and it was widely agreed kind of what the, the facts about a situation were. And with the, and there were some good things about that, about having a shared sense of truth. Oh, hold on one moment. All right, sorry about that. Um, so, um, so there were some great things about having this uh, this shared shared sense of truth, uh, kind of as a as a broader culture. Um, but there were also a lot of people's voices that weren't being heard, and there were some serious oversights. And so Renee talks about, for instance, the Vietnam War, where uh, kind of too many journalists with, went along with what the U.S. government was saying and uh, didn't share um, kind of a lot of the things that were going wrong and were not as as the government had said. Uh, we saw this again with um, uh, the Iraq War in the early 2000s. Um, after 9-11, uh, the U.S. decision to um, go into Iraq was not, uh, didn't receive the scrutiny that it should have and the, the kind of false claims about uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, so there were, there were downsides to kind of having this very centralized source of truth. Um, and so then kind of with social media, we've seen this rise of a lot of, lot of other people getting to have a voice, uh, which in some ways has been very positive, um, but in other ways has been very negative and has really led to this kind of fracturing of the ecosystem. And I think that, I just feel like uh, coronavirus really illustrates this well. So, oops, let me go back. Um, so this is a, a, a pathologist um, saying on Twitter, um, as a pathologist who follows COVID-19 issues closely from a medical perspective, I have to confess that I have learned far more from Facebook, Twitter, and WeChat than from peer-reviewed and even pre-pub medical research literature due to the time lag and in international borders. Um, I feel like Twitter has helped me stay kind of uh, very <laughs> informed about COVID-19 and to be um, alarmed about it uh, uh, in, a, in a positive way but prior to when many of my friends and family were kind of still saying like, no, it's just like the flu. Um, I feel like I would not have uh, recognized the risk as early without kind of the help of people I trust on Twitter. Um, in particular, I definitely want to give a shout out to Zainab Tefekci, who I think is an excellent source of information. Um, and she wrote, uh, she's kind of been uh, talking about this for a while, but in particular for me, kind of seeing that someone I uh, admire as much as Zainab said this was a real risk was really um, uh, helpful. And Zainab is a professor at the University of North Carolina and also writes for the New York Times, The Atlantic, and Scientific American. And she wrote a, a 
a great article in the New York Times uh, just earlier this week about, so kind of going along with all this is uh, a decline in trust in our institutions, um, some of which is merited and some not. Uh, but kind of one, uh, one example is um, in the United States, there have been a lot of messages to kind of tell people that we don't need to be wearing masks. Um, even though the evidence that wearing masks is helpful seems pretty strong, and we can also see uh, many countries in Asia um, effectively using uh, kind of uh, widespread uh, mask wearing as a, uh, a strategy for limiting the spread of coronavirus. And so part of what's going on in the U.S. is we have a shortage of masks, and so sometimes the message is because, you know, it's a lot of media outlets and um, kind of government sources have said, oh, masks won't help you as an average, uh, average citizen. And also all our healthcare professionals really need the mask. And people can tell the contradiction there of kind of, okay, why are they helpful for healthcare professionals and not for, for ordinary people? Um, and this is uh, kind of just one example of declining uh, or undermining trust in saying something that is uh, contradictory and it's uh, it's clear you know if you wanted to say we need to conserve our mask for healthcare professionals that would be a different message than saying no the masks aren't going to help you anyway you don't actually need one um, and so I thought this was kind of a an illustration of this tension between I think there's some very positive things about social media and people saying that they can get helpful uh, helpful information from it um, as well as the fact though that we uh, in the US I think are still not even it's starting to move there um, at a consensus of kind of how big a risk is this uh, you know there are many people that have been kind of watching on Fox News saying you know this is not an issue of this really kind of polarization and, and fracturing and let me um, pause here just to see if there are any questions or any comments about the reading, about media, uh, specifically about mediating consent. And just uh, feel free to put those into the group chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a question, where can we find the PowerPoint slides? Um, I'll probably post, uh, post the video and share a link, uh, a link with you afterwards. Although I prefer, to, I prefer to do it in video form so that you can kind of keep the context of the, of the comments. Any other questions or any thoughts of, about, the, about the mediating consent reading? I'm gonna get a sip of water too. All right, I'll, um, I'll keep going. So this was, a, this was an article, and this is actually came out like a month and a half ago. Um, I, should, I should note, so I taught, um, I taught a data ethics course for the certificate program at the Data Institute, and my material for your course has been uh, kind of adapted from that. Um, so in some places, um, you may see things I haven't, haven't updated yet because I am making some changes. Oh wait, there's a question. Uh, what's your view on Facebook's algorithm that falsely labeled uh, coronavirus related views as spam? I have to say, actually, I think I did not see that specifically. Um, I'm not surprised to hear that that's an issue. Um, this is, I'd say these are really tough problems of ident identifying what is disinformation and not, and what is spam and not. Um, and so I think there are kind of not easy answer. I do think, and even uh, just, uh, I think just this morning, Twitter announced that they're going to kind of stricter rules about cor coronavirus uh, uh, misinformation, but the fact that even right now, many uh, government officials don't agree on what's true or not, and receiving uh, kind of are receiving conflicting information. That these are challenging problems, and this and this doesn't is not to let anybody off the hook. And uh, I think blatant disinformation needs to be dealt with. Um, there's also this issue that a lot of uh, so social media is at scale, and we'll talk about this more later. Uh, but it's hard. Like I don't. An algorithm cannot effectively identify disinformation because that's a problem that involves a lot of context. And so we'll come back to that, but I think there's not an algorithmic solution. And I think there are problems with kind of trying to do things very cheaply at scale, which is the, the business model for all of this. 
Um, so good question, and we'll kind of return to those themes. Um, yeah, so the, uh, this article, um, uh, Control F in Building Resilient Information Networks, uh, was actually, this is at least five or six weeks old, because I included it in the previous class. Um, but there, uh, and Mike Caulfield is an expert who studies dig digital literacy, and the, the assigned, there was an assigned reading uh, profiling his work. Um, so he, he shared this example with a tweet that here it's got you know, over 3,000 retweets and 4,000 likes claiming, um, this is false, uh, but it claimed a husband and wife Chinese spy team were recently removed from a level four infectious disease facility in Canada uh, for sending pathogens to the Wuhan facility. And this is something, and then it linked to CBC, which is the Canadian broadcasting company, which is a reputable news source. And so he gives kind of what he calls like a 30 second way to check, like, hey, is this legitimate? Um, and that is to click the link and then use control F to search for words like spy, threat, etc. cetera. Um, and he discovered that the only time threat shows up in this article is to say that there is no threat to public safety. Um, the article did not say what the tweet was claiming it said. And he offers this as kind of a quick 30-second uh, check. Um, because a lot, of, a lot of techniques that were taught historically about checking information uh, focus on kind of like much longer analysis. But it's like if you give someone, you know, like a 30-minute method to check each tweet they see, they're not going to do it. Nobody has time for that. And so it's better to do a quick, um, a quick check. You're not going to catch everything. But to get in the habit of checking quickly um, is better than not checking at all. And if you give something kind of overly complex, uh, he also cited a 2011 study that 90% of web users don't know about Control F for searching, um, and so this is, you know, this is something that is a very, uh, very useful technique. So the article, so I shared an article or had a required reading on uh, kind of this profile of his work. Um, and in it, Caulfield is quoted as saying, people have been trained in schools for 12 years. Here's a text, now read it and use your critical thinking skills to figure out what you think about it. Professional fact checkers do the opposite. They get to a page and immediately get off of it. And so I think this is difficult because what we learn in school is often about uh, kind of analyzing a text uh, within that text, whereas really you want to go to another uh, another source and not spend too long on the particular source you're, you're, uh, you're fact checking. And also to not be... Um, not be overly reliant on your critical thinking skills because often uh, we're not going to have the domain expertise needed to adequately to adequately uh, evaluate whether something is true or true or false. Uh, so I want to recommend um, he's started a, a so he uh, Caulfield was studying digital literacy for uh, for I think year, decades even, um, but he did start an, another account on infodemic, specifically about uh, coronavirus. Um, they have great shareable threads and will often kind of deconstruct how do you evaluate something, and they go through cases where they're, you know, the tweet turns out to be true versus when it turns out to be false. Um, I think this is a good resource, and there's also a blog accompanying it. Um, and then if you're interested, um, he has lessons.checkplease.cc that are more broadly on digital literacy and how, uh, uh, how to identify disinformation kind of as an individual. And we'll get into more, disinformation is very much a systemic problem, and we'll get into that later in the lesson, but these are kind of just some tools um, as, a, as an individual. And he promotes um, the SIFT method, which is to first stop. And uh, while that might sound uh, simple, it's something that uh, the design of the social media platforms does not encourage us to do. If anything, it, uh, kind of Twitter and Facebook, really Instagram, um, encourage us to kind of act quickly and not to, to pause and uh, just think, you know, is this something that I really want to like or reshare? Um, so it's important even just kind of like taking that pause. Um, investigating the source, seeing if it's from a, a reliable news source, finding better coverage. Um, so sometimes if it's, you know, from a website you've never heard of, um, even if the story turns out to be true, it's probably better to share a version from a, um, a journalist uh, outlet that you're familiar with and know produces thorough and trustworthy coverage. 
and then trace claims, quotes, and media to original context. And something about disinformation that we'll talk about uh, later in this lesson is that often it's not a, a binary true-false, but in many cases it's about context and taking kind of a kernel of truth and then putting it into a misleading context. Um, and so going back to the original context can help you tell if something has been altered or misrepresented in a way that you, you may not expect. And I'll pause for a moment. Just uh, so you can type questions if you have them. I'll take a sip of water and then keep going. All right. This is a this is an example that a student in the certificate course found. Uh, a, so this must have been five or six weeks ago when we talked about disin disinformation and he shared it. Um, and at that point, um, when uh, you see, you know, Twitter shows you what's trending, one of the trending hashtags was no meat, no coronavirus. Um, and this is from kind of false rumors that you uh, get coronavirus from eating meat. And so if you're vegan, you'll be fine. Um, and so it's interesting that Twitter was surfacing this as a, a trending hashtag, so it's kind of showing it to people that otherwise wouldn't have seen it, like, hey, look at this hashtag. And yet at the same time, it was putting up this uh, kind of uh, display saying, know the facts, and, uh, to make sure you get the best information on the novel coronavirus, uh, you know, go to the CDC. Um, and so this was kind of an uh, interesting uh, contradiction that it's both, you know, in some ways kind of countering this disinformation by trying to point you to uh, a more reliable source, but then it was also still including it as a trending topic. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Something else that came up um, kind of as uh, students in the previous class looked at the hashtag is that, and this is true of most hashtags as well as most memes, uh, it was being used in very different ways. And so there were um, uh, kind of users in India that were using it to spread um, anti-Muslim content of uh, kind of, you know, just meat is bad, um, it's bad that Muslims eat meat. Um, and so you kind of had these different uses and meanings. And so I want to say that's a common thread in, uh, in disinformation as well as in meme culture. And there's a lot of kind of overlap with, with meme culture and, and uh, disinformation, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit later. And there, I mean, there are positives about, about meme culture, but it can, can play a role. And then a study that I'll come back to that um, is interesting and I think relevant here. Uh, so this is a study where the researchers asked people uh, whether, uh, whether uh, an article, uh, whether they thought it was trustworthy or not. And then they, and they measured uh, people's political stance um, and they had uh, disinformation that would be kind of, uh, in line with what Republicans think, and then also contrary to what they think, and same for Democrats, to see kind of this role of uh, political affinity. And they found that uh, both, uh, both sides of the political spectrum were uh, reasonably good at identifying when something was false. However, they um, separately asked when, uh, um, is this something you would share? Like, is this something you would like or share? And those results were basically completely uh, uh, orthogonal to whether something was trustworthy. And so when people are liking and sharing things on social media, they are not necessarily even thinking about is this trustworthy, uh, but are considering kind of totally, uh, totally different concerns. Um, an interesting uh, kind of uh, experiment that they did is they sent Twitter DMs to accounts that were sharing uh, disinformation from kind of low quality sources. And in it, they just said, hey, we're doing a survey. Could you identify if uh, this link is, you know, do you think it's trustworthy? And they did something that was not political. Um, and just by asking that question, they found that people started sharing from more, uh, more reliable sources for 24 hours afterwards, which is the, the only time period they looked at. Um, and so that was really interesting. And so there the idea was kind of just by even prompting people to think about trustworthiness as something that they should be evaluating, uh, that they saw uh, kind of better, uh, better results. 
Um, and they note in the paper that social media platforms by design often tilt users away from considering accuracy. Um, they encourage us to rapidly scroll and spontaneously engage. They mix very serious news content with emotionally engaging content, and so that can be hard to, you know, be reading about uh, kind of very uh, uh, serious issues and news events, um, and then have that interspersed with baby pictures and, and, and cat photos. Um, and also the immediate quantified feedback in, in the form of number of likes. Um, and so all these things kind of keep us from really uh, reflecting on accuracy. All right, um, so I'm going to pause. Um, I'll come back to disinformation later, but this was just a, a little bit that I think is relevant um, on kind of how disinformation relates to the coronavirus and what we're, what we're seeing in the news right now. And so then um, a second big area that we, we will cover this in week four, uh, privacy and surveillance, is how um, uh, efforts to, to stop the coronavirus uh, may be used to justify increase, uh, increasing surveillance and uh, some controversial um, impingements on privacy. Um, so for instance, there was a company, I think earlier this week, that announced that it's deploying a coronavirus detecting camera, um, that this is a surveillance camera with a thermal, thermal measurement in it. And I would say it's totally unconfirmed that this is even effective. Um, if it is, that would raise issues. Um, well, I mean, if it's it raises issues either way. Uh, if it's if it's doing what it says, and if it's not, about what that means. Um, Google, the the government partnered with Google just in this pilot program on uh, part of it's to kind of prioritize who gets COVID nineteen test. Um, but you, it turns out you had to have a Google account to to do it, um, which was controversial. Of kind of why is this private company that may not necessarily be uh, is up on kind of HIPAA and our uh, privacy protections uh, getting this data in this. Uh, and we'll, and we'll talk more about these uh, sometimes kind of opaque private-public partnerships and what that means. Uh, many, many governments have been uh, kind of weighing different surveillance tools. Um, Israel announced that it would be using uh, kind of some of its anti-terrorist measurements of uh, tracking people's individual cell phone data and who they're, uh, you know, are they properly socially distancing, who are they interacting with. Um, although there are kind of many, many countries around the world that are, are doing that um, with regards to coronavirus. There was the announcement that Uber had created a portal for public health authorities to, to share people's health data so that they could suspend drivers and riders. Um, and again, many of these things raise issues around privacy, um, you know, and understanding that people um, with coronavirus may be facing a lot of uh, stigma, um, and so we'll we'll discuss more, but just uh, this is definitely uh, uh, kind of bringing some of these issues to the forefront. Oops. All right, and so now, um, so that's just kind of uh, an opening, kind of how uh, how current events relate to this course. Um, now I'm going to just step back and introduce myself and say more about the course. Um, so. I've been at the Data Institute part-time for the last um, almost four years, and I've taught in the MSDS program during that time. I've taught electives uh, such as computational linear, linear algebra and NLP. Um, and then just last summer, we launched a new center of data ethics. Uh, with funding from Craig Newmark for our inaugural year, and with the goal of really focusing on kind of what are the ethics issues, what are the most urgent ethics issues where real people are already being harmed by them. Um, and in particular, really we'll be covering a lot of them in this course, I see a few big areas as bias, disinformation, and surveillance. Um, and we want to, uh, want to be involved with a mix of uh, education, research, policy. Uh, we did host a tech policy workshop in November, and uh, that was fully recorded. I've released uh, some of the videos, and we'll be releasing more in the, the coming, coming month, hopefully. Um, we've also, it's, uh, we had some great speakers lined up for the Friday seminar later this spring. We've had to, we've had to cancel those um, for, 
for obvious reasons, but I hope to bring those speakers back in the future. Hopefully as alum, you can, you can come back and, and hear those talks. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. And so I'm the, the founding director for the center. And so this has been my full-time focus uh, since last summer. Oops. Let me move the group chat, okay. So uh, previously, I have a PhD in math. I had studied math and computer science in undergrad, and then I worked as a data scientist and software engineer in the tech industry. Um, so I realized that I think you've met all the other professors by now, but since this is my, my first course for the year. Um, I've also taught, and I've taught at the, <laughs> um, you know, uh, college and grad school level. I've taught in a, a coding boot camp, so I've kind of taught online, so I've seen a variety of, of education models. Um, and then I'm co-founder of Fast AI, just this, uh, which is a nonprofit research lab making AI more accessible, particularly to people with little data, with diverse backgrounds, or outside of what is kind of seen as the stereotypical AI researcher. Um, and we have a course, a, practical, a free course, Practical Deep Learning for Coders, that's available online. And also taught in person, uh, usually at the Data Institute, uh, although we are, we are doing it virtually this spring. Um, I write about issues of uh, data ethics, and that was part of how I first, so several years ago, kind of started spending more and more time uh, writing about data ethics and speaking about it until it kind of took over, took over my life um, and tweet about these comment, uh, uh, these topics frequently as well. So for the course, um, I'll be using forums.fast.ai for our online discussion. Um, in the email, I sent out a link to a spreadsheet. Um, so you need to create an account, which is free, and I will add you to the private group to, to access this, this forum. Uh, a few things to note. One, I do plan to, while it's private right now, I do plan to open this up uh, later this summer, and I will send out an email before I do, but wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, secondly, I've used the same group for the certificate course, so you will see kind of uh, people that you won't recognize from the MSDS, and that was the, uh, the 40 students that took the certificate course. And I checked uh, not too long before class, and it looked like I think 49 of you had created, a, created an account. Um, if you haven't done that yet, please do so, and please add your username to the spreadsheet, um, and I will kind of keep adding you to this group. Um, feel free to create new topics here, particularly if you uh, read about something related to data ethics and are curious about what others think. You can also discuss more kind of related to the, the lecture or the readings. Um, so this is uh, where we'll be doing our online discussions. All right, now I wanted to say a little bit just about uh, tech ethics and what we teach when we teach, uh, teach ethics. And so Casey Fiesler um, is someone I really admire, a professor at the University of Colorado. And I guess about two years ago, she created a crowdsource spreadsheet uh, collecting syllabi of who is teaching ethics-related courses in computer science or um, information schools, kind of technology-related data science programs. And she collected over 200 courses, uh, which is amazing. And so that's a great resource. And you can find this online. It's kind of this uh, spreadsheet. And I love, love reading other people's syllabi to find out what they're teaching. Um, and then uh, Casey went on to do a meta-analysis of the syllabi. And she wrote a paper about that, what do we teach when we teach tech ethics? And first, I want to say there are a lot of kind of open or uh, debated questions just within this field of teaching, teaching ethics. So one is, should ethics be a standalone course, which is what this is, uh, versus worked into every course, uh, which is a lot kind of more complicated logistically to pull off, but to have a little bit of ethics in kind of every course in your program. Um, and so clearly, uh, we're doing the, the standalone course here. There are also kind of debates about who, uh, who should be the one teaching it, a computer scientist, a philosopher, a sociologist. And if you read, uh, read her paper, she has a kind of a, a table of what were the home departments for all the people teaching the courses listed, uh, listed in the spreadsheet. And here it is. Oh, let me move the, the video. Um, 
So where was the course home and the instructor home? And just look at the variety here. So there's computer science, information science, philosophy, communication, science and technology studies, engineering, law, math, business, uh, really, really wide range. And then what topics to cover? Uh, this is such kind of such a broad field. So here is a list of some of the topics that can be covered. Uh, law and policy, privacy and surveillance, philosophy, inequality, justice and human rights, AI and algorithms, social and environmental impact. Um, actually, I'm not gonna read these all because it's too much. AI on robots, work and labor, cybersecurity. Um, and so this is, this is way more than you can cover in any one course. You can probably tell, but these are, these are all important topics. Um, what learning outcomes? And so this is the area where there was kind of the most agreement. Um, in particular, um, uh, being able to critique, uh, and I think that's kind of critiquing products and design decisions, um, spotting issues, making arguments, improving communication. These all showed up kind of repeatedly in a lot of the syllabi. So this is a little bit uh, kind of encouraging that here there is uh, kind of some common skills being taught. And then I just am gonna share one quote from the paper. Our analysis reveals a great deal of variability across tech ethics courses in terms of the content taught. However, the lack of consistency of content is not surprising considering the lack of standards in this space and the disciplinary breadth of the syllabi we covered. Um, and this is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and I think she goes on to say that we can kind of uh, potentially learn from each other and see what, uh, see what different groups are doing. But this is an incredibly broad and interdisciplinary field. So for, for our course, um, here is a list of what we'll be covering, uh, disinformation, bias, and fairness. Um, so I like to kind of start with really kind of practical case studies, and then we'll go back more to kind of the foundation of ethics and kind of, uh, you know, what even is the study of ethics. I do try to focus on kind of uh, practical tools you can use. I hope that this will be useful to you in your, your future workplaces, uh, privacy and surveillance who, how, and why pro problems get scoped the way they do, our current ecosystem, and by that I mean the, the kind of the, uh, the tech ecosystem, so certain attributes of uh, venture capital, of, uh, of how tech companies operate, of uh, things like uh, um, hypergrowth and blitz scaling, also the reliance on metrics. Um, and so these are kind of patterns that show up across the industry that have helped uh, kind of create some of the situations that we're in and are important to understand. Um, algorithmic colonialism, so when you have uh, companies from one country kind of operating in other countries, often with uh, uh, not much understanding of the, the local culture, um, and then the kind of next steps in how, how to keep going with this. Um, I should also note to so the, uh, the previous course I taught was six weeks long, um, and this one is eight weeks long, although the, the class periods are a little bit shorter for this. Um, so I uh, currently have week seven and eight uh, listed as to, to be decided. I think that we're gonna kind of uh, run over on some of this, uh, but I will, I will kind of keep you posted on, on, on what, I, uh, what I add. Oh, quick question before we move on from the overview. Uh, will we only be using the Fast AI forums, or will we also have a Slack channel? Um, I would prefer to only use the forums in that uh, the forums have much better search functionality. I think a problem with Slack is that uh, you can end up kind of having the, the same conversation um, again and again because it's uh, tougher to search. Uh, the forums automatically... Uh, uh, even when you start creating a topic, we'll show you similar topics to make sure that your question's not already answered. And I think they kind of create something that lasts longer. Um, although you, uh, you all are welcome if you, uh, let me know if you would want a Slack channel just for yourself. I, I think I would prefer to keep most discussion on the forums, I'll say. Another question was, who are the type of people that took the Intro to Data Ethics Certificate? That's a great question. It was a really, uh, really diverse group in terms of background, which I loved. Uh, so we had, we had software engineers and data scientists in it, uh, but we also had uh, product managers. We had grad students from a few different fields um, and different programs, uh, people 
and a lot of people were kind of bringing, you know, we had a few people that work in um, kind of medicine or uh, patient related fields and were interested about uh, health data. Uh, we had people that had worked in trust and safety. So it was people that had worked at nonprofits. Uh, so it was, it was a very broad group, which was pretty, pretty interesting. Another question, is this more like a philosophy class? Learn more about problems ra rather than solutions, which may not exist yet. Um, it is, yeah. So I, I try to offer, I call them steps towards solutions in, in each lesson, but many of these problems are so uh, kind of complex and also relatively new, or at least new to be getting this kind of uh, widespread attention, that there are not good solutions yet, which can be really, um, really dissatisfying, I know, because, you know, I want better solutions, and I, uh, often people ask me, like, what they can do, and I, and I will just tell you suggestions, there are definitely things you can do, but often they are not, in fact, they are not full solutions, which I know can be discouraging, um, and, on that note, I uh, read an interview with Julia Anglin from last year, and Julia Anglin uh, was a, a senior reporter at ProPublica, and she helped create the, the field of algorithmic fairness. Uh, she worked on the investigation of the Compass recidivism algorithm uh, four years ago. Um, and what she said was that kind of, she thinks we're really in the early stages of, of diagnosing the problem. And if you look at something like the Industrial Revolution, um, hold on a moment, I'll be right back. All right, sorry about that, I'm back. Um, so I was saying Julia Anguin gave this analogy with the Industrial Revolution where, I mean, we had, you know, children working in factories for 12 hour days and kind of huge upheaval to society. Um, and she says, you know, it really took a few decades first for journalists just to kind of get a scope of what the problem problems were and do all this diagnosis and muckraking and kind of uh, bring and bring attention to these. Um, and then, you know, various um, activists and advocates could for push, push for kind of what changes were needed to address, um, address the issues that it raised. Um, and so she said she, she feels like kind of we're still in like this earlier stage with a lot of the, the data ethics issues that have arisen where we're still even just figuring out how do we accurately diagnose and describe the problems. Um, so we'll we'll talk we'll talk more about that. I do try to give some some practical steps, but yeah, there is <laughs> the solutions are not are not fully there yet. All right, so ethics is um, the discipline dealing with what is good and bad, a set of moral principles. Um, as I mentioned in, uh, in lesson three, we'll come back more to kind of uh, ethics and what are some common kind of ethical philosophies. Ethics is not the same as religion, law, social norms, or feelings, um, although there is some overlap with all of those things. Um, ethics is not a fixed set of rules. That's something else that makes it hard is there's not just this like you know, here's the checklist. If you do this, you're guaranteed of being ethical. Um, but there's a, um, a lot of ethicists talk about this idea of moral wisdom and kind of the need to, over time, build up your moral wisdom in evaluating, evaluating problems. Ethics uh, is a well-founded, are, are well-founded standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do. And then it's also the ongoing study and development of one's ethical standards. And I think we'll, we'll read these later if you did want to kind of peek ahead of just to even know kind of what are the, the foundations for this. Um, there's a, what, if, what is ethics and an overview of ethics and tech practice. I'll be using a lot of uh, resources on this topic from the Marcula Center at Santa Clara University. Um, and they have a great uh, kind of, and it's been around for quite a while. Um, so it's an ethics center and they have a, a technology focus group that's put out a lot of, a lot of great work. All right, um, so now I'm gonna get into, so that was all kind of just a, a, a prelude. Um, I'm gonna get into disinformation. And looking at the time, I think maybe, maybe we'll go ahead and take our um, seven minute break now. Uh,
since this is kind of a natural stopping bait point, so it's uh, 1246, uh, so come back here at uh, 12, 1253 and we'll continue and kind of get, get into disinformation. Um, and feel free to type in any questions or comments you have in the meantime. Thanks. All right, hello, welcome back everybody. So we got some great questions during the break, so let me go through some of these. Um, so the first, um, histor historically, before the prevalence of social media engagement, um, how did governments handle the conflict between personal privacy and public health? Um, were people, popular culture, in fa favor of weighing one over the other? Um, I mean, so one thing to note is that historically we didn't have uh, have enough data kind of to do the types of surveillance that we can do now. Um, so there wasn't, uh, and I, I will think more about this question, uh, but some of the things that are kind of possibilities now with surveillance and tracking information just wouldn't have even been an option before. Um, there were, I mean, there were issues uh, as you can think about in the United States. Uh, this is not about public health, but uh, kind of about supposed public safety, where the uh, 1940 U.S. Census results were used to place Japanese Americans in um, internment camps, um, and we'll talk about that more later. But there, uh, people, and I think that was very unethical. Um, uh, kind of this decision was made of, you know, let's use this data in a way. And actually, at the time the 1940 census was taken, it was illegal for the data to be shared in that way, but uh, the U.S. changed its laws during World War II. Um, uh, that was a time where uh, uh, kind of people were saying like, oh, this is justified because of um, supposed uh, kind of uh, safety concerns. Uh, but on the whole, uh, I don't know that we had the, the same amounts of data historically. Next question. Um, so it was mentioned that a possible, a possibly better way to evaluate an article or piece of info was to get off that page and look into other references um, or mentions of that piece of info as opposed to solely using one's critical thinking. Since this is a very domain agnostic way to evaluate the credibility of information, wouldn't this make it particularly suited for a potential algorithmic solution? Uh, where the form or structure of a piece of info situated with respect to other info, such as the citation network analysis, is supposedly easier to analyze. Um, I, I really don't think the technology is, is there yet in terms of um, kind of understanding what a, uh, a piece of writing is saying and understanding context, which is a very difficult problem. Uh, there are many, and I taught, I taught NLP last summer and was really trying to uh, stay up to date on, on what's the latest. Um, I think kind of in NLP and actually really being able to understand uh, what's being said and context and different ways of saying the same thing and how slight variations in a sentence can really, uh, really change what's, uh, what the meaning is. Uh, we're still uh, have a, a long, a long way to go on that. Um, Next question, is Uber's decision to suspend accounts of infected people ethical? It seems unethical from a patient's viewpoint, but ethical from a healthy person's viewpoint. Um, and so this will cover a lot more when we cover privacy. <laughs> I'll actually, I'm gonna look at the syllabus and even potentially move privacy forward. Um, one, what I'll say briefly now, one question is always to ask, um, when, I think it's easy to kind of get into a particular thing, you know, is this thing that Uber said they're going to do, is this ethical? I think it can be very helpful to step back and think like, what are our overarching goals and are there more effective ways to get there? Um, so if we have a goal of we want people with uh, coronavirus to stay home, it might be helpful to think like, you know, should we be uh, giving them all payments so they're not having to go to work and that they, you know, should we give them uh, kind of guarantees of their job protection and money? Like, do we need to be working on a kind of safer subsidized meal delivery, but looking at a range of options as opposed to just kind of pointing at the uh, kind of particular one being proposed. And often there may be uh, both more effective and safer ways of going about uh, a particular goal. Um, I also think it's important to think about what can go wrong. Um, how could this data be misused? Uh, kind of what does it mean to be giving personal uh, data to, to private companies? And that raises, raises a lot of risk. And we'll talk about that more with uh, kind of in the privacy and security unit. Uh, next question, uh, do you believe it is possible or advisable to come up, uh, to try to come up with an algorithmic or automate, automated solution for fact checking, identifying disinformation? 
Uh, what are some caveats if one were to attempt this? Oh, and there's a, a, a automating the SIFT method, showing multiple measures of trust. Um, so I think like, so with the SIFT method, some of that is about design, and there are a lot of design decisions that, uh, so one is like, uh, Facebook mobile doesn't make it easy to read the full URL um, or even to for people to tell kind of which links are clickable um, and that's something which can make it harder for people to inspect so I definitely think there are uh, kind of design decisions that can really influence influence this and I, I think that's uh, useful to uh, to pursue um, I'm I am skeptical that it could be fully automated but yeah I do think there are helpful things you can can do along the way um, and I'm, I'll, I'll come back to this. They're also, they're kind of a, I, I, I yeah, I'll, I'll come back to this later in the lesson. Um, is there a nice tool out in the market to help fact check the info? When did it first publish? Who published that first? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't, I don't know if a comprehensive one. Another, kind of another big source of disinfo is uh, taking, taking things out of context. And this happens a lot with photos. And so, um, I saw I saw a talk where they showed some pictures. I can't remember. I think they were from the California wildfires, and somebody used them in a tweet and said it was like a bombing in Syria. Um, and so there, you know, the photo was true, but it was uh, put in this very misleading context. And so there was a team that was looking at, you know, would it just be helpful to have the metadata on the photo of like, hey, this photo actually first appeared, you know, in California, you know, a few years ago. Um, so there are some efforts on that, um, and I will, I will come back to this. But there are a lot of psychological factors beyond just fact checking, um, and so that uh, in some ways, fact checking is not going to fully solve this because of uh, all the psychological factors that go into kind of why we believe what we do. Um, and then there's also, I want to say, very, very uh, misaligned profit incentives for the companies. And so I think the, the profit incentives are a, a really kind of underlying issue that we will talk about more. Um, more questions. Uh, would it be considered as misinformation if there is no accepted ground truth? Um, yeah, and this is, uh, this is difficult. Uh, uh, a, a difficult issue in that, um, as I mentioned before, a lot of misinformation is this blend of, of, uh, of fact and fiction. And then, yeah, there's the issue of uh, when people, people don't agree. Um, so these are great questions. Uh, thank you. I am going to launch into this lesson, and I think this will kind of help uh, at least get towards answers towards some of them as well. All right. Uh, so disinformation, the threat we are facing, is much bigger than just fake news. Actually, let me just close this door. Too. All right. So um, this is uh, this is from 2016. There was a Facebook page called Heart of Texas that created a, a, a anti-Islam event outside an Islamic center in Houston. Um, so. It created this event, invited people to come. Uh, another Facebook page set up the counter protest um, of people uh, supporting uh, freedom of religion in the US and um, kind of diversity and inclusion. And so uh, a lot of people showed up uh, for both protests. The, the counter protest was, was larger. And a journalist that covered this for the Houston Chronicle uh, noticed something odd, which is that he was not able to get in touch with the organizers for either side of the protest. And so then it came out months later that both sides had been organized by Russian trolls. And so this is, um, uh, I think, it, interesting example, and a, a lot of uh, disinformation takes this form. Here, you know, these are uh, real people who were at the protest, uh, and I think would assume that most of them felt very strongly about their beliefs. And so, in that sense, like their beliefs, uh, you know, it's not false that this is uh, their feeling, um, but they're having this debate in a way that was framed kind of very dishonestly uh, by uh, uh, by Russian trolls. Um, so, uh, and this is a, this is a, a form that a lot of uh, disinformation may take, where it uh, can be real people, but having debates kind of uh, not necessarily framed in ways in ways they would have chosen. 
Issues of disinformation have been in the news a lot, in the, particularly in the last year. Uh, deep fake videos have gotten a lot of, lot of attention. Um, I was, uh, if you're interested, um, on NPR last summer on the podcast uh, First Amendment on the threat of deep fakes. Um, and then also I am uh, very concerned about the powers of newer language models for automatically generating text. Um, and this has on the whole gotten, I'd say, less attention than um, uh, synthetic videos, but I think is a, is a real risk um, and has been has been generated or has gotten some uh, some attention. And so uh, today, and this will this will definitely go into next week as well. I'm going to talk about kind of what is disinformation, how are the tech platforms making it worse, how will new advances in AI make it worse, and what should we be doing about it. So this fall, um, so, so Radio Africa was a Facebook page uh, uh, in Sudan uh, offering, uh, offering local news, and it was revealed that this was actually uh, set up by Russian operatives. And so this was research done by the Stanford Internet Observatory that broke, I uh, can't remember, September or October. And uh, Russia had been uh, working in six different African countries, and um, in many cases, basically, were creating what looked like local news sources, and they were even hiring local local people as reporters for these sources. Um, and it, and the news was not just um, it was not just kind of things that are false or pro Russia news. It also included a lot of stuff on local sports and local culture and the weather. And uh, some of the sites had the type of stuff you might see uh, kind of with a travel agent of you know why you should visit this place. Um, and so this was this was pretty sophisticated. Also, uh, many of the Facebook pages uh, uh, kind of tried to channel people into WhatsApp groups. Uh, so this was uh, kind of a multi-platform, uh, multi-platform effort. And again, it was in six different countries. And, and particularly, the kind of hiring local people as part of it um, is is kind of a, another step in sophistication. And this is uh, something that will become uh, even more widespread. So there were 73 Facebook pages with close to 10 million interactions, often purporting to be local news sources and um, uh, kind of encouraging people to join WhatsApp and Telegram groups, which were um, encrypted, so we don't have the information about those. So disinformation is a lot more than just, quote, fake news or, or fabricated content. It's not just news, it's memes and videos and social media posts. Uh, this is an article that uh, kind of goes back to, I think, early 2014 and uh, talks about uh, so a group of uh, trolls um, on, on the anonymous web uh, uh, posted that they uh, wanted to create fake accounts, uh, such as this one for Nene Can't Stop, um, kind of claiming to be, to be black women with the goal of getting the hashtag cancel Father's Day trending, um, which they were successful at doing. Um, and this was kind of to, uh, and they, they were successful in getting kind of right-wing media outlets then to pick this up and kind of, oh, look at how uh, kind of extreme and stupid feminists are. They're trying to cancel Father's Day, even though it was uh, kind of this coordinated, coordinated uh, attack. Um, uh, several black women were kind of successful in identifying like, hey, these accounts look fake, these aren't real people, uh, but it was, uh, and then this is kind of a playbook that we have uh, increasingly seen. Um, so this idea of kind of uh, uh, creating fake accounts to try to, to you know, game, uh, game what's trending. Um, this also, I think, captures, this is true of a lot of memes. There are things that I'm sure to some of the people doing this, this is, you know, a, a joke, um, you know, they're probably different levels of irony. There are people that are taking it very seriously, um, but this really kind of does have an impact on, on, on how we see each other. Uh, so disinformation includes rumors, hoaxes, propaganda, misleading content, misleading context. Uh, most of it is misleading, uh, not, not fake. Um, and so, and so these notes are from Claire Wardle of uh, First Draft, who has been studying disinformation for a very long time. And definitely, definitely recommend following her. Um, and she she talks about how the term fake news has been co-opted and used to attack the press. And so she advises uh, not not using the term. And then let me pause and see if there are questions here. All right.
So disinformation includes orchestrated camp. Oh, let me just see what this. Oh, someone I was just noting that scope switched to calling things junk news um, instead of instead of fake news. That's interesting. I didn't didn't know that. Uh, disinformation includes orchestrated campaigns of manipulation. Um, and so something to keep in mind is that I think it often we talk about things in terms of individual posts, you know, is this particular post uh, disinformation, but really kind of you need to think more broadly as this kind of orchestrated campaign that may involve uh, kind of many posts and be multi-platform um, and many, many different actors. Um, which is what what we saw here with this uh, uh, Russia Russian operation in Africa. We also need to think of disinformation as an ecosystem. So again, it's not just some kind of single post or some single article that's false. Uh, but it uh, is this whole ecosystem. And so Kate Starbird is a researcher at University of Washington. Um, you should definitely be following her. And in fact, she she studies uh, specifically uh, disinformation during crises. Uh, so this is kind of a very, very relevant time. And she, I think this goes back to, uh, she studied kind of the, the Boston uh, Marathon bombing. That was eight years ago, seven or eight years ago of kind of how, how do rumors start? How does disinformation spread? Uh, but so something uh, kind of she shared was this interesting, so this was looking at um, a group called the Syrian White Helmets, um, and it's kind of very controversial of, you know, are they helpful, um, good, they're doing humanitarian work, or are they kind of this uh, uh, colonialist uh, uh, kind of practice? Um, and she looked at here. She's looking at Twitter, kind of who is who's retweeting different information, and the pink are people that are um, against the the white helmets um, and think they're they're bad. Blue is kind of um, in favor or positive about them, and showing kind of who's retweeting who. And she said most of most of the people um, uh, tweeting about this seem to be real, uh, real genuine people who who seem to be who they say they are. Um, however, it was interesting to look at kind of what sites they were they were tweeting from. As you see, uh, YouTube.com is a big one up here. Um, however, the the box is covering uh, Russia Today, uh, the Russian state media, and oops, as well as Sputnik News, another another Russian media org. Um, and so it can be kind of just even seeing where where things are being tweeted from, but it's kind of this whole uh, whole ecosystem. And she also talks about a kind of a common issue we have is where the the same article or same information is often posted online from many different sites. And so when people go to search something, they may say like, hey, five different news sites covered this, but it's really just the same article showing up uh, again and again, uh, which can also make it kind of harder to tell, you know, is this a uh, something that many people think or is it just coming from this kind of one source that was was echoed? And she, she writes about kind of how disorienting it was to just even even study this. Of uh, I think there was a question about you know getting at the ground truth and kind of what is what is the ground truth about the the white helmets. So Claire Wardle talks about this idea of the trumpet of amplification, uh, which is how um, how. Uh, information kind of can spread from platform to platform. And so many things kind of start on the uh, uh, anonymous web, and then they get picked up by closed groups, such as WhatsApp. Uh, as a reminder, WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. Uh, Telegram, Facebook Messenger groups. From there, they might spread to conspiracy, uh, conspiracy communities on Reddit or YouTube. Again, a reminder that YouTube is owned by Google. Uh, and then make it to more you know, mainstream social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and then get picked up by professional media and politicians. And I think I think we're increasingly seeing where you don't even have to uh, make all these hops, and things can go kind of uh, uh, straight to, uh, straight to professional media or politicians picking them up. Uh, but this is something that makes it really difficult to address uh, address disinformation because it is it is multi platform, and sometimes groups are taking advantage of the the different rules across different platforms. Um, Let's see, I don't know. And one of the reasons I think this is important and why it's an issue is that disinformation undermines democracy. 
Um, so I think we really uh, need a shared, a shared sense of truth and what, uh, what are the facts to, uh, to even be able to act and to address kind of what are the problems, what do we know about them, what can, what can we do to address them. Um, so Ladislav Bittman uh, worked for um, the Soviet uh, kind of disinformation and defected to the United States uh, in, the, in the late 70s. Um, and he um, then became a professor of disinformation, and he's written that most campaigns are a carefully designed mixture of facts, half-truths, exaggerations, and deliberate lies. Kate Starbird wrote, disinformation is not just about bots and trolls, it targets, cultivates, shapes, and ultimately leverages unwitting crowds to further spread and achieve its objectives. And so often, you know, very sincere people can be caught up in it. Um, in particular, something we've seen is this uh, real proliferation of this conspiracy theory mindset and people that are kind of looking for conspiracy theories in everything that can now, uh, you know, is this kind of self-perpetuating machine to, to produce disinformation. Um, and so this example I gave earlier of here, you have uh, kind of real sincere people, um, but this is still this is still an example of disinformation um, since the uh, events themselves were, were kind of organized in this deceptive way. Disinformation pollutes our information environment. Um, and so it's something where then uh, one of the <laughs> And maybe even the bigger concern is not just that people may believe something that's false, it's that they will stop believing what is true. Uh, 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 disinformation can be exhausting and kind of get people to give up on the truth or feel like, well, I, I guess I can never, never know what is true uh, because uh, there's so many conflicting messages out there. So Zainab Tefekci uh, wrote about this in Wired last year. Uh, when I talk to dissidents around the world, they rarely ask me how they can post information anonymously, but do often ask me how to authenticate the information they post. Dissidents can end up putting their lives on the line to post a picture documenting wrongdoing, only to be faced with an endless stream of deliberately misleading claims. That the picture was taken 10 years ago, that it's from somewhere else, that it's been doctored. Um, and, and Zainab, I think, would... Uh, I know uh, supports the need for uh, whistleblowers to be anonymous or to use kind of stable, particularly uh, stable pseudonyms over time. Um, however, this is really interesting and it shows uh, kind of this asymmetry of people can take great risk to uh, reveal a true wrongdoing and then have someone say, oh, that's just disinformation, um, which is uh, kind of incredibly, incredibly harmful uh, when, when people give up on the truth. Uh, censorship now works by flooding with information, by causing distraction, by causing confusion, by creating doubts and just this question mark and shadow so that you really can't figure out what's going on. And to me, this is almost the, the opposite of whistleblowing. This is whistle drowning in confusion and distraction. And so here she's kind of talking about when you leak uh, kind of huge, huge reams of documents uh, where it's not clear kind of what the message is. Um, and so it's, uh, and, and people can kind of read there, and so this happened with uh, Hillary Clinton's emails, uh, where, you know, there wasn't a clear message of, definitely like the public needs to know about if there is something uh, kind of alarming, but this was more people can make all, kind of all sorts of conspiracy th theories through this mass, uh, mass of documents. Um, and this is, this is a real change in the nature of information. For, for most of history, uh, kind of information was much more limited. Um, and it is only, I think, really with the web that we have moved into this stage where there is just these massive, massive amounts of, of information, and that's changed what, what censorship looks like, uh, as well as uh, kind of what, what disinformation campaigns look like. Um, so she, uh, she refers to this idea of uh, hack and leak. Uh, we also saw this with ClimateGate, I don't know if you remember, uh, longer ago where uh, these emails were hacked from a bunch of climate researchers. Um, Experts agree there was not anything actually controversial or wrong about what they were doing, uh, but people kind of created this narrative of, you know, these climate researchers are so dishonest and are, are doing shady things with the data, which is an example of this called narrative laundering, where you take real documents, these are real emails, and build, kind of build a story on top of them. Uh, there have been warnings, uh, Renee DeResta has warned, we'll see 
uh, probably increasingly people mixing fake documents in with large dumps of real documents. Um, this uh, apparently happened with, there were cyber attacks on anti-doping agencies and they released kind of all this information from them and apparently some of some of that was was false. Um, so these are uh, really kind of uh, large areas for concern of uh, kind of how how the form that attacks can take. All right, I'm just going to get a drink of water. <laughs> Right. Let me see if there exists. Let me see if there are any questions. Okay. All right. So that's that's kind of some background on disinformation and what forms it takes. Um, I'll just say one more thing about uh, kind of modern censorship um, uh, going back that it that it really often involves also kind of flooding all of us with information and so even though people from a wider variety of backgrounds are able to you know try to get information out there uh, particularly through social media because there's so information so much information out there it can be harder for us to even find kind of what is important or for someone to find an audience when they when they have something noteworthy I'm um, just since we're so uh, inundated with with large quantities of information so now I want to talk a little bit about how the tech platforms um, kind of unwittingly often incentivize and promote disinformation and um, this is in their design and architecture their recommendation systems, their business models. Um, so it's kind of really, really uh, baked into it. So this is not just uh, kind of, not just about uh, bad actors uh, posting disinformation, but about kind of what's rewarded by the, the tech platforms and how, how do they kind of uh, uh, encourage us as users to behave as well. So Guillaume Chaslot is a former, um, has a PhD in AI and was a former um, engineer at uh, Google uh, and YouTube. And he, uh, he has been very outspoken and actually included his, uh, his reading as one of the assigned readings about how conspiracy theories can be uh, really promoted by recommendation systems. Actually, I'll, I'll kind of mention that about the, the reading first. He, uh, you know, showed that kind of if, if you're trying to maximize uh, watch time on a platform, uh, telling everybody else that other platforms are lying may increase the amount of time people spend watching your platform, uh, but it's, it's bad, uh, kind of bad for society. And so he has been monitoring YouTube externally through his uh, nonprofit that he founded, um, Algo Watch. And he, he produced this graph last year of, uh, so here the x-axis is number of channels recommending a video, and y-axis is log of views. And you see this kind of extreme outlier that was being highly, highly recommended, um, even though it wasn't uh, necessarily the most popular thing at all. All right, so, sorry about the interruption. Um, so YouTube, where was I? Okay, yeah, so I was showing this extreme outlier of being highly, highly recommended. This is Russia Today's take on the Mueller report, um, even though it wasn't even necessarily something that people loved watching. Um, and so, uh, and this was, this was picked up by the Washington Post. Um, this really suggests that Russia Today has perhaps gamed uh, YouTube's recommendation system, which is not, uh, I think, not surprising. Um, and I wrote a blog post about this, which actually I should link to. Uh, David Uminski and I then expanded into a paper that was accepted to EDSC, um, and I'll uh, maybe post that on the forums, about some of the problems with metrics. Um, and we'll, we'll cover this more in lesson five. Um, but anytime you are using metrics that are super important, um, people will, will try to game and manipulate them. Um, and so this is something that I think is going on kind of with all, with all recommendation systems. Let me, let me check for questions. Oops. All right, no questions so far. That's fine. 
All right, then I, I talked about this paper earlier. Um, I thought this was interesting just kind of about uh, the psychology of people when they choose to share things on social media are not necessarily even thinking about, hey, is this trustworthy? Um, but, you know, they might be thinking like, what resonates with me emotionally? Uh, what uh, kind of what uh, fits with my group. Um, and there's a lot about the design of the platforms that encourages us to really scroll and spontaneously engage. It does not encourage us to pause and reflect. Uh, the platforms often don't encourage us to, to leave their platform and go to other, other websites. They mix very serious news content with emotionally engaging content. And then they give this uh, kind of immediate quantified feedback in, uh, in the form of number of likes, which really then can influence uh, kind of how we behave, what we post. Because um, I think there's kind of this inherent uh, everyone likes getting more likes. And uh, it, it's hard not to then let that start driving, driving behavior. Um, I do want to note that it's more than just the algorithm. Uh, Becca Lewis is a, a PhD student at Stanford in communications, um, has written about kind of other ways that um, uh, YouTube in particular uh, may promote uh, conspiracy theories um, just in, in terms of its design, kind of sociological uh, factors in uh, kind of how people relate to YouTube celebrities and how YouTube celebrities relate to their audiences. Um, but there's, there's a lot about the ecosystem and that you know, no, uh, no technology, we'll talk more about this later, uh, no technology is neutral and there are always kind of things about the design that will, uh, will encourage, encourage certain behaviors. Um, and so I thought, I thought this was an interesting, interesting paper. So our online environments are really designed to be ad addictive, and this is part of the underlying um, model of ad revenue of kind of the more time we spend on there, the more ads were shown, is more profitable for the, the platforms. Uh, the incentives focus on short-term metrics, and um, this is true with metrics in general often. It is much harder, I think, to measure uh, kind of long-term impact, complex uh, long-term relationships, um, and so those things tend to be neglected in uh, metrics, and this, we even see this with kind of like the focus on quarterly earnings in the corporate world, that it's harder for, for companies to um, uh, consider, consider or prioritize the, the long-term long impact of their behavior. And then the fundamental business model is around manipulating people's behavior and monopolizing their time, uh, which, and I don't, I don't think that all advertising is inherently bad, um, but just it is this uh, kind of business model that's really, really driving um, a lot of the uh, decisions that are made on how to structure the platforms and what they do. And we'll, we'll talk more about this. Um, on, the, on the note about addictive, um, kind of the addictive nature, Zainab Tefekci uses an analogy of uh, kind of an automated cafeteria that is learning to kind of add ever more sugar and salt and fat into foods and kind of shove them in our faces without us even asking for them. Um, but to really, uh, you know, and these are things that in the short term we may want, you know, it's like, oh, someone's shoving french fries at me, that's super appealing. Um, but the platforms don't always give us a, a good way to think about like, hey, long term, uh, how do I feel about this? Is this the decision I want to be making? Um, you know, there's something, I think in the short term, it's often, you know, easier to, to read kind of clickbait type articles and their you know, kind of pique our interest in the short term way. Whereas, you know, reading long form journalism that um, the reporter spent months and months uh, investigating and had to talk to many sources, you know, that's something that could have kind of a, a better long term impact on us. But it's a hard, it's a hard decision to make in the moment, particularly when the platforms are not at, not at all designed to support us in making those making those decisions. Uh, Renee DeResta uh, used this slide in her, her talk at MozFest um, in 2018. Our political conversations are happening on an infrastructure built for viral advertising. And so there's kind of this real, uh, real misalignment there, like what is, what is good for, for viral advertising uh, may not be good for having yeah, nuanced political conversations. I'll check the, the chat again. Take a drink of water. All right, 
So there's a question. Uh, do you think platforms changing their addictive approach, skewed incentives, uh, requires government intervention or societal pressure, both, how do you affect change? Um, so this is a big big question. I, um, I do think it will require um, government in, um, intervention, uh, particularly around uh, the profit incentives. I think as long as it's kind of so profitable to be doing what they're doing, they're not gonna be able to, to make uh, significant changes. Um, and some of what's happening right now is I think a lot of costs are being externalized to society. And so, um, you know, this is something we saw and still see to some extent with uh, uh, kind of the environment of, you know, if a, a factory can kind of dump all its pollution in a lake and make huge profits, that's something where they have externalized uh, their negative costs to the rest of society while they get to, to keep the profits. And I think that there are ways that... Uh, the, uh, the major platforms are kind of polluting our information ecosystem. They're also, we'll talk about this more on, when we talk about privacy, they are kind of polluting uh, the, the sense of ambient privacy and what some of the, the benefits of that may be. Um, and so I do think you need to change economic incentives and I think that um, government is one, one effective way to do that. Um, but these are, these are uh, hard, hard problems. All right. So humans, um, so now I want to talk more about, yeah, about people, um, um, and, and, and I'll get into this modern technology. Um, humans evolved as social beings um, to have our opinions influenced by others in our group. And so, uh, and this is hard because I think most people like to think of themselves as independent minded, um, but we are, we are kind of motivated by uh, who we see as our in group and in opposition to who we, who we see as our out group. And this, this has a, an impact on, on, on what we believe. Uh, people, people are forming a lot of discussion, uh, a lot of opinions online uh, through discussions. Uh, so this is a uh, debate on Reddit about whether the U.S. should cut defense spending and instead um, spend money otherwise. Uh, so we've got different comments of, you're wrong, the defense budget is a good example of how badly the U.S. spends money on the military. Someone else, yeah, but that's already happening. There's a huge increase in the military budget. I didn't mean to sound like stop paying for the military. I'm not saying that we cannot pay the bills, but I think it would make sense to cut defense spending. Um, so here, here's a discussion. So you can type into the chat. Does anyone want to guess which subreddit this is from? Any guesses? Um, these are all all reasonable guesses. I have not have not seen it yet. So I see guesses for politics, military, unpopular opinions. Give one more moment, and then I will say it. All right, this is, uh, this is actually from the GPT-2 subreddit. Uh, so these comments were written by a language model, uh, specifically, specifically uh, GPT-2. And thank you everyone who guessed, I know this was kind of a trip, trick question. Um, and so uh, uh, language models are producing uh, more and more uh, compelling text. Um, these, I think if you really, and I, Kind of intentionally went quickly. Um, if you read them very closely, some of them sound a little bit off, although a lot of online comments from real people sound off. Um, and this, um, I should say, this is all kind of in good fun in this context because the subreddit is clearly labeled that it's, uh, that it's the GPT-2 uh, language model making these posts. Um, but this is something that I think is really uh, concerning and raises, uh, raises a lot of potential issues. So, um, so GPT-2, and so yeah, GPT-2 is very controversial. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I just uh, uh, first want to read, so this was uh, uh, partially released from OpenAI last year, and then they've kind of done uh, several kind of uh, partial releases. Um, this is a language model, but it was very, um, it was very in keeping with uh, kind of the, the thread of NLP research on language models. So the techniques were kind of not outside what, what other, um, other groups were doing around language models. 
Um, so one example that the team shared uh, from OpenAI, so they gave, uh, gave the model the human written prompt. In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. So that part was from a human. Then the next part is all from the, the language model. So this is what the language model came up with. Dr. Jorge Perez, an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz, and several companions were exploring the Andes Mountains when they found a small valley with no other animals or humans. Perez noticed that the valley had what appeared to be a natural fountain surrounded by two peaks of rock and silver snow. Perez and his friends were astonished to see the unicorn herd. These creatures could be seen from the air without having to move too much to see them. They were so close they could touch their horns. While examining these bizarre creatures, the scientists discovered that the creatures also spoke some fairly regular English. Perez stated, we can see, for example, that they have a common language, something like a dialect or dialectic. Um, so I think this is really compelling prose. Um, and not, not everything that GPT-2 produces is quite this compelling, but this is um, really compelling and kind of well-written well uh, to, be, to be produced by a language mo uh, model. Oh, sorry, I see a note that it was um, AI unpopular opinions. Um, although I thought it was subsimilar, some simulator GPT-2. Um, well, either way, let me uh, uh, go on with this. Um, so I'm sure you've also heard about, um, uh, or I should say, uh, this is Katie Jones. Um, her LinkedIn profile listed her as a Russia and Eurasia fellow. She was connected to uh, kind of several people at uh, relatively mainstream uh, Washington think tanks. And uh, the Associated Press broke a story last summer that Katie Jones is not a real person. Uh, so this photo was actually generated by a GAN, a, gener uh, a generative adversarial network. And so, um, you have to think about how these technologies can be combined. Um, so, you know, we've got kind of increasingly uh, compelling language being produced by computers, along with increasingly compelling pictures. So these photos are all from uh, thispersondoesnotexist.com. Um, I really think they look like, they look like real people. And online discussion will be swamped with fake manipulative agents, um, kind of even, even more so than it, than it already is. Actually, let me just pause and if, see if there are questions. Okay, so, um, oops. All right, so um, so this is this is from uh, so in 2017 the FCC uh, was considering repealing net neutrality and they opened up for comments to see you know do Americans how do they feel about net neutrality and um, they got a lot of responses. Uh, millions and millions of responses that were opposed to net neutrality saying well yes let's repeal it, um, including these listed here and I'll uh, read you a few. Uh, probably move this, I can actually see it. Um, individual citizens, as opposed to Washington bureaucrats, should be able to select whichever services they desire. People like me, as opposed to so-called experts, should be free to buy whatever products they choose. Citizens, rather than the FCC, deserve to use whichever services we prefer. And so you might detect a pattern, which has hopefully been color-coded here, that this is kind of a Mad Libs style, where uh, there are certain things that go in the initial green blank. Uh, citizens, people like me, individual citizens, uh, just something different for the kind of coral-colored spot as, um, as opposed to or rather than. And then there were some choices for the orange spot. And so you can see these are kind of very, very formulaic. Um, and so this comes from a data analysis done by Jeff Cow. Um, and he found that more than a million of the comments wanting to repeal net neutrality were likely faked. Um, so these were being submitted as kind of real individual comments, um, but they found kind of followed this clear, clear formula. I should note that Jeff Cow was now a computational journalist at ProPublica. Pro 
And he wrote a fantastic blog post on this, which I, I recommend reading. It's a, a great, great analysis. Um, so first of all, um, after clustering comment categories and removing duplicates, he found that less than, um, so basically three to four percent of the 22 million comments were truly unique. Uh, this does not mean that they were all uh, uh, fake. Uh, many of those come from, you know, there are uh, kind of automatic templates you can get to, to email in uh, kind of in support or uh, uh, against an issue. However, this kind of mail merge Mad Lib style was definitely deceptive. It was an attempt to make things seem unique uh, when they weren't. Um, and there are, seem to be uh, likely multiple other campaigns like this. And so even though more than 99% of the truly unique comments were in favor of net neutrality, if you looked at the overall uh, kind of overall thing and not, uh, not taking these into account, it would seem like most of the submissions were against net neutrality. Um, and so this was, this was a great analysis. However, this was done in 2017, which, well, it may not seem that long ago. In NLP years, that was a very long time ago because we've had such, such big advances in NLP since then. Um, and particularly, we did not have sophisticated language models back then. It would be far, far harder to identify uh, this type of campaign now if someone was using a, a, a kind of, you know, one of the, the newest versions, such, such as GPT-2, of language models. Actually, I'll check the check the chat again. Okay. And so um, this is, yeah, this, uh, this certainly concerns me uh, of how, uh, how this could be used to um, uh, manipulate public opinion. So uh, my co-founder, Jeremy Howard, said last year, um, I've been trying to warn people about this for a while. We have the technology to totally fill Twitter, email, and the web up with reasonable sounding, context appropriate prose, which would drown out all other speech and be impossible to filter. Uh, kind of the stuff, um, the stuff I'm showing is very, very difficult to filter out. And in fact, I think it's always going to be an arms race um, around filtering it and then people developing even more, more sophisticated models. Um, and this is, you know, it can drown out real people, right? Like ideally the FCC would be uh, just receiving submissions from actual, uh, actual humans on, on how they feel and not these uh, kind of coordinated uh, manipulative campaigns. Um, and something kind of that makes this uh, even worse is that extreme viewpoints can be normalized when we think we're around others who hold those views. Um, so they're kind of the views we hear help shape what we consider the range of acceptable or normal views. Um, and so on a very kind of um, serious uh, and, and sad note, uh, we've there's been this increasing um, radicalization um, happening online of uh, kind of people being radicalized into um, white supremacist terrorism and other incredibly, incredibly destructive uh, philosophies. Um, so I guess a year and a half ago, uh, there was a shooting at a Pittsburgh synagogue in which 11 people were murdered by an anti-Semitic white supremacist. Um, and he was someone that had been very, very active on social media, even posting directly, directly before committing the shooting. Uh, last year, there were uh, shootings at two mosques in New Zealand, uh, and the New York Times, and 49 people were murdered. Uh, the New York Times characterized this a mass murder of and for the internet. Uh, the attack was teased on Twitter, announced on the online message board. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to remove, uh, 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 people have been saying to not even name the boards because uh, you don't want to encourage new people to go there and I need to update my slides, but on an anonymous message board and broadcast live on Facebook, the footage was then replayed endlessly on YouTube, Twitter, and Reddit, and the, and the uh, social media platforms were all trying to take down the footage, but it was it kept being uploaded. Um, and so this is something that is already um, incredibly tragic and harmful that is happening online. Um, and I think it just adds kind of uh, another scary element of how uh, manip manipulative campaigns to influence public opinion and to radicalize people uh, could be just even kind of further uh, amplify this destruction. 
So let me go to the chat. Oh, okay. Um, this is a, a great question, and I, so I'm going to get there shortly. Uh, what happens when there is no perceptible difference between real and fake prose? Are there efforts of digital signing of content to verify its origin? So, uh, yes, this is something that um, experts um, that I, I respect have proposed that we need uh, uh, digital signatures. Uh, in particular, uh, Zainab Tefekci wrote about that in Wired. Um, and she she uses this analogy, and I'll have this in a later slide of you know a long time ago, like if uh, if you didn't know if someone was still alive, they could like hold up a photo with the the day's newspaper, uh, kind of proving they were alive on that day. And already with Photoshop, that that doesn't make as much sense anymore. Um, but how can we kind of verify? And so she, yeah, she says we, we need to move to verification systems. Oren Etziani, head of the Allen Institute on AI, wrote a great article on this on HBR last year that I think I quote later. Um, but that's one effort. Um, and I'll talk about some um, kind of other proposals towards solutions, but I do think that's a, a promising one. Let me just keep an eye on time. So we have about six minutes left. I want to, yeah, actually I'll pause for a moment to see if there are other questions. We will continue this next week, and next week I'll get into kind of uh, steps towards solutions. So maybe I'll just briefly uh, show you. So we'll come back to this. So I have this section on what should we do. I will come back to this, but um, uh, in, in more detail next time. Uh, basically, a few approaches. So there are efforts to detect fakes and disinformation, which is an arms race. And that's not to say that we, we shouldn't do it at all, uh, but to be mindful that that is not going to fully solve our problem. Um, and in particular, if you're familiar with GANs, um, the idea is you have kind of two different models that are both uh, kind of using the feedback from the other to get even better. And so your, your model that's generating fakes can kind of use the feedback from the detector to get even better at generating fakes. Um, and that's part of why this, this will always be an arms race. There's also responsible development tools. Um, so I'll recommend um, a VIB of Avadia, who does uh, kind of research on this, of if you're a researcher, so if you're working on something like Adobe's Photoshop or anything to develop synthetic videos or deep fakes, what are the responsible ways to do that uh, that will hopefully at least like, again, this is not going to solve it, but limit some of the misuse. Then I do think we need to address the broader ecosystem. So I talked about these misaligned incentives of how uh, Kind of it's just it's so profitable uh, to kind of to do the wrong thing um, and so addressing that is a kind of underlying problem uh, treating treating this as a cybersecurity issue and uh, uh, Renee DeResta and Mike Godwin have written about that uh, uh, and this can involve a number of things of you know red teaming like intentionally kind of looking for the uh, the ways the ways things can go wrong being very proactive about that um, and then verification tools as, as Kevin suggested. Um, so I'll go into to more detail about all of those next time. Um, and actually, I, I perhaps will, will stop here today. Um, but so yes, I will, uh, uh, I know this is a, a kind of pretty serious, uh, uh, serious lecture in terms of some of the content, um, but there, there are approaches, there are researchers working on them, although there's a lot more that needs to be done. And uh, I would say all of these tools have kind of some incomplete, incompleteness in terms of, in terms of the, the, the final outcome. So I'll just uh, pause and see if there, there are any final questions for today. All right. Um, yeah, so I mean, feel free to reach out to me uh, during the week. Uh, definitely, if you have not created your account for the forums yet, please do so. Feel free to start a topic to discuss any of these issues that you're interested in discussing. Um, I will I will share the recording of the, the presentation with all of you, because I believe this was recorded. I'll post that on the forums as well. I see that as a question. Yeah, um, thank you, everyone. And yeah, while I'm... Uh, sad that we can't we can't be together in person um, even though it's absolutely the the most responsible thing for everyone to be uh, keeping their social distance right now um, I hope that we can really have a kind of good uh, virtual connection and discussion about all of this um, so thank you